Welcome to uh, another uh, excellent uh, fireside chat that we have in store for you today uh, with Jason Robbins, who is the founder and CEO of uh, DraftKings. And Jason, let me let me begin, if I may, by uh, first of all welcoming you, but welcoming you in a way home uh, to Miami. Um, tell us a little bit about your your background growing up in Miami and how that had an effect on your interest in, in sports and, and what you're doing now. Well, thank you, John. Appreciate you having me. I grew up uh, most of my you know childhood. I moved to Miami. Um, I was born in California, but I was less than two years old. So all I remember from my childhood is Miami. And um, we moved here because my father got a job at the University of Miami at the you know business school. And he was a professor of economics. We actually had a wonderful retirement celebration, which he so graciously hosted earlier today that um, you know, made him very proud after almost 40 years. So, you know, University of Miami was, was something that was always close for me, uh, being that my father was there. And uh, when I was growing up, it was the 80s, which was really one of the, the great periods, one of the golden periods for any football program in college. And uh, it was amazing. I saw players from, you know, Bernie Kosar to Vinny Testaverde, Randall Hill, Michael Irvin, you name it, um, as a child. And I just absolutely fell in love with the U and with the Canes. It was uh, it was a real passion of mine. I, I think I can count on one hand the number of home football games I missed in my childhood from the age of about four years old um, when I started going to games till I graduated high school. Uh, and it was such a special, you know, introduction to me of what it meant to be a passionate sports fan. Um, the Canes, you know, I liked sports in general. I liked other Miami teams, but the Canes were my true passion. Um, and really, you know, it, it taught me what it was like to be such a dedicated sports fan and, um, you know, follow every statistic, every play, everything. I knew it all. Uh, and it was also a special thing because it was a way I bonded with my parents. Both my parents were huge Miami fans and um, my dad and mom used to take me to games. And uh, it was just a really great, you know, set of memories from my childhood. Can, can you can you remember uh any particular uh, game or particular play that really had a, a major impact on you uh, one way or the other, positive or negative? Well, it was all mostly positive then, as we talked about earlier, it came right. to an unprecedented 58 game home winning streak. So I uh, didn't grow up knowing what a loss really looked like for many, many years. I was in for a rude awakening once I saw that, but um, you know, I remember the play, uh, it was a little controversial at the time, but I remember it as a kid when Randall Hill caught the touchdown pass and ran into the tunnel and, and uh, you know, this thing and everybody went crazy and you know, thought it was the most controversial thing in the world and that was seared in my brain. Um, that was a big memory and then, you know, many years later, uh, I remember, um, you know, seeing the Canes go on, I think it was like a 37, 38 game winning streak, they won a national championship there. Uh, this is a little after I graduated, after I went to college, I should say. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, there was a, a terrible call we were talking about earlier on a, a, a double overtime, a pass interference in the end zone that robbed them of continuing the streak against Ohio State in the national championship game. Um, so that was a great memory. Last thing I'll say is I remember the first um, time it was a, in a negative way. It was one of the few losses I saw, be it not at home, it was on TV, uh, when the Hurricanes were a heavy favorite. I believe it was in the Fiesta Bowl, I want to say. Um, and Vinny Testaverde had just won the Heisman. Uh, and, you know, they had a very unfortunate loss. They, um, you know, lost, I think it was to, I want to say to Oklahoma, but I may be wrong, I'm blanking. It was Penn, it was Penn State, I think they lost to. And uh, 1986, I think it was Fiesta Bowl, um, you know, Vinny, who had been just absolutely incredible all season, you know, through some really bad interceptions. So that, that was, I think, the first time I can ever really remember seeing the Canes lose. I mean, it was right. shocking. I didn't, I didn't know what I was watching. I, I couldn't believe it. I just thought, like everybody else did, that they were going to win going into the game. And sure enough, they came back the next year. And I think that was Oklahoma that they beat the next year. Uh, in the Orange Bowl to redeem themselves and win the national championship with Jimmy Johnson. So that was, that was a fun time. So, so if you were such a big Kane fan, how come you went to, uh, went to Duke for your undergraduate? 
I couldn't get into Miami. No, I'm kidding. I, I uh, <laughs> you know, part of me, I wanted to get away from home, not because I didn't love my home. I absolutely love my home, but I just wanted the experience of being able to live away from home. I also have a long family history at Duke. My grandfather went there. Uh, my uncle went there. I have several cousins who went there um, through my mom's side of the family. So uh, I always was a big Duke fan growing up too. It was Miami and Duke were my two big. I, I liked Miami for football and baseball and Duke for basketball. I kind of cheated. I picked the best of both worlds on that one. Um, but, you know, it was uh, at the time they weren't both in the ACC, so it wasn't hard. I never had to watch them play each other and figure out who to root right. for. Um, and I had a great experience at Duke. I loved Duke. It was such an awesome place. And I, I got to come home to Miami where my sister went to college. So um, lots of family history on both. What, what did you major in at Duke? And then what was your path from Duke to uh, DraftKings? I had a double major in economics and computer science. I had a minor in math, which was actually quite easy because you know all, I think all but like one or two courses that I would have had to take for the math minor, I already had to take for the econ and comp side double major. Uh, and then, you know, after I graduated, I graduated at an interesting time. I started college in the late 90s. It was the height of the tech boom, the original tech boom. And, um, you know, there were these companies. I remember going to the first career fair that, uh, you know, I, I, I had since I went to school, the career fair at Duke, and seeing, you know, all these tech companies that had raised hundreds of millions of dollars on these you know, crazy ideas. And I, I, I really got excited about it. And um, I called my father and I said, you know what, I want to drop out and move to the Bay Area and become a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. And he you know, put the fear of God in me and said, you, you know, you're crazy if you do that. You're going to ruin your life. I'll cut you off. Like anything you could possibly say to talk you out of it. And ended up being really a good thing because about, you know, 12 months later, the bubble burst. And, you know, I went, I remember going to the career fair the following year and gone were all these internet companies. It was all banks and consulting firms and, you know, the like. So, uh, it was good. He, uh, he gave me good advice. I don't think he necessarily knew the tech bubble was going to burst, but he did know the value of getting a great college education. And that was something that my parents always instilled in me, the importance of education. So, um, you know, I stuck it out. I finished up at Duke. And then after Duke, I still kind of had the entrepreneurial bug, but we were kind of, you know, we we're still in an environment where it was kind of tough to, to start a new tech company. So I went to work for a company called Capital One, which you know, it was really a really fantastic experience, great company. I learned a ton. Uh, and I got all excited uh, after several years there. I learned a lot. I met one of my eventual co-founders, Matt. We were all excited. We were going to go start a business and in 2008. Hit. So once again, I had terrible timing. Um, 2008, of course, after the banking crisis, the mortgage crisis, there was no capital coming into startups. And so uh, I decided, okay, I'm going to go try something else for a little bit. So I went to a company called Vistaprint at the time. It's now called Simpress. And, um, you know, after uh, going to there, I, I was really happy. Again, it was very fortunate for me that it worked out that way because, um, you know, I really didn't know what I didn't know. And I ended up learning a ton about the internet. I met my third co-founder, so second co-founder, three of us, Paul. Uh, I recruited Matt over there. And then a few years later, the three of us started to get the bug again. And um, we decided this time we're really going to do it. We didn't have the excuse of a bad economy or anything like that. Only problem is we didn't have an idea. So we used to go out, um, you know, after work for dinner or drinks and throw around ideas. We must have thrown around, you know, dozens and dozens of them, nothing stuck. And then one day my co-founder, Matt, sat me down after work and he said, I got an idea. And I said, what is it? And he said, you know, basically he described to me the, the high level uh, essence of what DraftKings fantasy sports was. And it took me about two minutes to say, I think this is the one. I think this is it. I, I, I was like, am I missing something? Um, and it, the thing for me is I was a big fan of fantasy sports and sports in general. So my first instinct was, am I thinking this is too good just because it hits home for me and it's something that I would like? Um, but then I went home that night and I, I researched it and I, I did a bunch of um, you know work. I found there were actually others doing similar concepts, which at first you know, kind of freaked me out. I said, oh, we missed it. We weren't the first ones to do it. But what, um, one of my mentors at the time told me, he said, uh, that's actually a good thing. You don't want to be the only one going at it. That shows that there's validation in the marketplace. It's also, you know, as things come up, you're not trying to build an industry all by yourself. You have others doing it. You just got to out-execute and out-compete everybody. 
very important. Tell, tell us a little bit about Paul and Matt and what are, what are their strengths and weaknesses and what are yours and how do you complement each other as a, a team that's held together so well? Well, I think it starts with a huge amount of mutual respect for each other. Um, we all come from similar philosophical backgrounds. So I think it was really um, easy for us to get on the same page about how we wanted to start a business and what the philosophies of running a business would be. Uh, but we all had also very diverse skill sets. So that was helpful too. And that's a, an interesting combination when you can get people that you all kind of bring things, different things to the table from a skill set perspective, but you're totally aligned on how you want to run the business, being technology oriented, using data to make decisions, investing in analytics. You know, those were things that we all, you know, really passionately believed in and were 100% on the same page on. And so, you know, the three of us really, I think, were, were a good fit from that standpoint. We didn't know what we were going to do for a while, but we knew that we shared very similar philosophies and brought different things to the table. Um, you know, Paul was the one who, who coded the initial website. Um, we all laugh now because the tech team had to rebuild a lot of what he did, but he was the one who was able to figure out how to hack it together and get it off the ground. And, um, you know, after the three of us worked for many, many nights and many uh, weekends working, you know, out of Paul's spare bedroom in Watertown, Massachusetts, uh, we finally decided we we're going to raise some money. We didn't know any idea what we we're doing. None of us had done anything like that before. We just went out and we figured it out. What um, what advice do you give to uh, students? I'm sure many many young people ask you, uh, "How did you do it? What advice would you give me? Uh, I want to start a business." Um, I think you've mentioned a couple of things which are important that um, it takes dozens and dozens of ideas typically before you find one that's going to hit. Uh, and then secondly, you've also mentioned the uh, complementary skill sets of team members and not trying to do it all on your own. Are there some other things that you could add by way of advice for young people seeking to be uh, entrepreneurs? I think the most important thing is to get great people around you. Um, in all facets, um, great mentors who can advise you. The best thing about getting advice from people who've done it before is it helps you avoid making mistakes. Um, there's an old Oscar Wilde quote uh, I like that, um, I'm gonna butcher it, but it's something like experience is just the name that we give to our mistakes. And um, I always thought of that and said, if I can avoid having to actually experience things by making mistakes to gain that experience, uh, by getting the benefit of other people's experience and listening to them, then that saves me from making mistakes. And anytime you can do that, not that we're afraid to make mistakes, but if you can learn without having to make the mistake by listening to other people who've been through it before, that's a real gift. So getting great people around you and on the mentor side, great people around you that work with you and for you. Um, you know, nobody's built a company by themselves. I've still yet to find one person that built a huge company all on their own. Uh, it doesn't happen. You have lots of people that contribute to it and having the best people is really the big difference. Um, you know, companies don't build themselves, people do. So if you have great people, generally speaking, you know, good idea, great people, you're going to figure it out. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is don't be afraid to, to pivot a bit. Um, whatever you think, even if the same high level vision is true, whatever the details that you think of how you're going to do it, Whenever you get into it, it's always different than you thought. Things don't, you know, rarely work out the way that you thought they would. And you got to iterate. You have to be very, we, we always use that word, iterate, you know, learn and iterate. Um, look at data, learn and iterate. Once you figure out something that maybe you thought would work, doesn't work, and there's something else you should be doing, don't be stubborn. Don't hold on to it. Don't think, you know, I got to do it this way just because I said I was going to. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is, um, you know, one of my uh, mentors from uh, Harvard Business School, you may know him, Noam Wasserman, mm -hmm. pointed me to a book he wrote called The Founder's Dilemma. And there's a, a line in the beginning or a chapter, I should say, is one of the most important questions an entrepreneur has to ask uh, him or herself is, do I want to be rich or do I want to be king? And you know that's an important thing to know too. Do you want to maintain all control? Is it about the power, or is it about you know building the biggest thing possible and making you know yourself very successful and wealthy? And 
Um, sometimes those two things can go together, but more often than not, it's a trade-off that, you know, in order to be successful, you have to give up control. You have to delegate and give things to other people. You have to not make it all about yourself and not, you know, you know consolidate power and make it all about, you know, you. So I think that's an important decision. It's a personal decision, but I figured out after, you know, listening to one of Noam's lectures early on that that's something that, you know, was very clear to me. I didn't want to be king. I wanted to be rich and I wanted to do something that would have an, a lasting impact on the world. And I wanted to make a lot of people around me um, very rich as well and have the success shared with others. And actually, you know, very few things I can point to in life make me prouder than many of our early employees who believed in us and, um, you know, took a risk and came along for the ride now have made tens of millions of dollars. And I love that. And um, it was interesting. We were actually worried when we went public and all these people suddenly had all this newfound wealth that we were going to have a big Christian issue and everyone was going to leave. And so, you know, my co-founders and I, in sort of a panicked way, got together and said, what are we going to do about this? We're going to lose all our people. And so, well, let's, let's talk to them. And we went and we talked to them and uh, virtually every single one said the same thing to us. They said, are you kidding? We're so grateful for this opportunity and so happy about this. We're not going anywhere. We're loving it. We're having fun. So that taught me something else too, which is, you got to be having fun. Um, you have to create an environment where other people are having fun. Um, yes, it's nice to, to do well financially. And yes, it's nice to, you know, have something that you build that you're proud of. But if you're not enjoying yourself day to day, you know, who, that's not a way to spend your life. And um, it's not just you, it's the people around you, your employees, your colleagues. So um, make sure that, you know, yes, you're working hard. Yes, you're driving results. Yes, you're tough on each other when things don't go well. And maybe even sometimes when they do. But you're also, you know, a tightly knit group that loves working with each other and, you know, really enjoys the experience. And I think that's an incredibly important part of it, too. There are a couple of challenges um, in the human resource area that sometimes are associated with uh, fast growth companies. Uh, one is that the people who were with you early on don't grow themselves or develop themselves as fast as the company. Uh, and sometimes you have to then bring in outsiders who sort of know what a billion dollars in sales is in order to get you to a billion or the next billion. So that, that's one issue. And then I think perhaps as a, a very high profile company now, um, you must receive hundreds, if not thousands of CVs uh, and, uh, you know, interested uh, applications for employment, you know, every week or every month. Um, how do you sift through those to find the people who are right for you and your business? Are there, are there a couple of key attributes that you look for in everyone or a couple of key questions that you ask that um, delve into, if you like, the philosophical orientation of the uh, candidate? How, how do you deal with those two issues? Well, part of both of the part of um, the answer to both of them uh, is to have a great HR team. We early on, and I actually think this is a mistake a lot of companies make, they, they view HR as sort of, you know, at worst a cost center, um, but, you know, in a maybe milder version of that, it's just not the highest priority to invest in early on. There's so many things you have to do. You have to build the product, you have to market the product, you have to make sure your books are in order and HR is often a forgotten thing. So um, we, we didn't do that very early on. We made it a priority to have a great HR team to make it a core strength. And we had a fantastic chief people officer, his name is Graham Walters. And, you know, really we, we were, we staffed there and we, we brought in great people. Um, and, you know, on the first question that you asked, having someone that really can help understand the full people dynamic and you know the, the sort of 360 feedback everyone's uh, you know, giving to people around the organization really help you understand you know what's needed out of different positions in the organization. I think is really important. Um, we've always had a bias towards trying to promote from within, but you're right. The reality is that especially in a fast-growing company, you're asking people to grow at a pace that maybe not all of them can. Um, in a typical corporate environment. You grow at a certain pace and, um, you know, in a startup, you're required if you're going to, to continue to advance to the ranks to grow at a pace that's much, much faster than that, um, you know, to keep up with the growth of the 
company. So uh, you're right, not everyone will do that. And if you have good people around you and if you're objective yourself, you'll recognize and that's not the case. I always bias towards trying to get coaches for people and trying to like really invest in development so that we could get the people uh, that had, you know gotten us there to get to the next level. But if that's not the case, you got to bring in other people. And um, one of the other things we did is we, we, from day one, every single employee in the company has equity. So the nice thing about that is um, everyone feels like an owner and everyone wants to see the company succeed because that's going to you know, help them the most financially. So uh, a lot of times we would have people that actually proactively come to me and say, hey, I really want to stay here, but I feel like if I'm going to take on what you're asking me to take on, I'm not going to do well. I'm going to need more support. Um, actually asking to have people hired over them, saying, I want to stay at the company, but mm -hmm. I can do what you're asking me to do. I think I need someone to come in and oversee it, but I can do the next layer down. Um, and so if you create an environment where everyone's really centered around the companies first, making sure there's loyalty to your colleagues and not wanting to let them down and wanting to make everybody around you successful. Sometimes you get situations like that where people self-identify or at the very least, if you have to go to them and say, listen, I think we need to bring in somebody else. They say, okay, they don't fight it. They understand that it's what's best. Um, and if you do a good job, you're never going to hit hundred percent. There are people along the way that we, you know, weren't able to get over that. Um, you know, they just had in their head that, somehow it was negative for their career to accept that. But most people weren't. Most of the people along the way actually either grew into the role or understood that it was the right thing to, to bring in somebody else. Um, and then on the second topic, um, similar story uh, within the, the people team, we have an incredible talent acquisition group. And what they look for actually varies depending on the role. So, um, you know, for hiring, uh, analytics people you know, or, or engineers, it's very different than what you would look for uh, if you were hiring somebody into, you know, the, the people department or into the legal team. So um, definitely it varies by the role. But one thing we, we always value first is horsepower. Um, and it's hard to know that from a CV. Sometimes, you know, you don't get that until you bring somebody in for an interview. But I would say we've um, de-emphasized somebody that's done exactly this before and had check every box, the perfectly relevant experience more for somebody, you know, that just is hungry and smart and um, you know, has a real desire to succeed and real strong horsepower. We, we call it, um, you know, intellectual horsepower and drive. Uh, and, you know, perfect example of that is our CFO. Our CFO, um, you know, when I hired my CFO about this point, almost two years ago, um, we were thinking about going public uh, in the not too distant future. And everybody on my board told me, you got to get somebody with public company experience. You got to get somebody who's taken companies public or managed big public companies before. And we looked and we, we certainly interviewed several candidates that had that on their resume. And then I met this guy, Jason Park, and he didn't have it on his resume. He was a, a partner at Bain Capital, never had taken a company public, never had worked for a public company. He was you know, an operating partner there. So he had a different sort of experience than somebody who was just evaluating deals. He was somebody that went in once they bought a company and helped kind of shore up the operation. So he knew how to operate, but he didn't have that check the box, public company experience, taking a pub company public. But I just knew after meeting him and talking to him and having other people meet with him that he was our guy. And he's been unbelievable. I mean, he's been so good. I could not have asked for a better person. And he's really been the one who's you know, built out that department, manages all of our IR, um, you know, crafts every sort of, you know, earnings call script with our IR team, analyst day decks, or investor day decks, like the ones we just did, and just really has like an incredible and uncanny ability to tell a story to the street. He'd never done it before. Um, but you could just tell that that intellectual horsepower is there and that core ability was there. And so, perfect example of somebody that, um, you know, several people on my board were like, okay, we support you, but not the profile we thought. And now every single one of them has said, wow, um, we were wrong. This was absolutely the right person to hire. Where did the uh, name DraftKings come from? And uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the funding process um, as you grew uh, up to the point where you IPO? So my co-founder, Matt, 
uh, who's the one who originally came up with the idea, is the one who created the name as well. The way that we came up with it, um, we initially had decided, so there were, as I mentioned, when I looked uh, and found, you know, dozens of, of others doing this, it seemed like a lot of them had the word draft in their name. Um, we kind of had in our head, a lot of us were online poker players and a lot of the poker applications or websites were called, you know, poker this or poker that, party poker, poker stars, you know, poker. poker. Uh, so we said, okay, like probably makes sense to have something in the name that signifies it's part of a particular type of product suite or industry. And it seemed like the word draft was just what everybody, um, you know, was using. Funny enough, uh, when I, when we later expanded into the UK, I, I went out to London to tell somebody about it and they said, oh, is that a beer company? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure. uh, didn't, didn't necessarily have the global, uh, uh, you know, um, connotation, but, uh, you know, at the time that was what a lot of these were called and then that came up with the rest of the draft. As far as the funding process goes, um, you know, the beginning was really hard. Uh, it kind of cycled. It went from the first couple rounds we raised were incredibly hard. I mean, I was rejected by probably 50, 60 people before we got our first round of funding in. And then we got very lucky. This is dumb luck because I would have taken money from anybody. I didn't know any better, but we got lucky that a, a VC by the name of Ryan Moore at Accomplice Ventures wrote our first check. And um, <clears throat> the reason we got lucky, it was a VC and not an angel investor. Uh, and then we had others in like Boston Sea Capital that were VCs too that came in alongside them. And the reason we got lucky, uh, or I say we are lucky, is because the next round was just as hard. I got told no by I can't tell you how many people. And the only reason the company was able to raise funding is Ryan said, I believe in you. I'm going to lead your next round. And if it hadn't been a VC, it would have been an angel investor. They never would have been able to put in the capital he did. But he put in, I think, four or five million bucks as the lead check in the next round. And then I went and I was literally for like two, three months straight hustling around New York, picking up 25, 50, 100K checks to try to round out as much as I could before NFL season started. So pretty much from like, uh, you know, June until late August, I was just running around picking up any check I could. A guy named Brian Rubenstein at Counterview Ventures, uh, which he hadn't started at the time, him and his family did a, a bit of it, but it was, it was really like a lot of family money in New York. And then we went back and I went to my team and after this brutally hard two fundraises, I looked at them and I said, um, you know, I've learned from this that the only way we're going to continue to raise capital is we need to see a big spike. We need huge traction. And we were coming into NFL season. We were a, senior, uh, a seasonal business and the NFL was so important to us. I looked at my co-founders. I said, it was so hard to raise this money. We worked so hard to get it in. Now we need to go spend all of it in the next five months. And they looked at me like I was insane. They said, are you kidding? This took so much to raise. We need to make it last years. And I said, it's not the right move. And they're like, you're nuts. What are you doing? And I said, look, we have to go for it. This is the only um, you know, opportunity that we're going to have. If we, if we slowly drip it out, the market's going to run away from us and we're never going to raise money again. So we did. And um, about two, three months later, I went back out this time to Silicon Valley uh, and ended up um, 30 days later having four term sheets at a valuation that ended up being, um, you know, roughly about uh, four and a half times what we had raised on just three months earlier. Um, and, you know, that was just like the fact that the business had traction. It was also just demand. We had four people that wanted to do the deal. So we were able to run a very competitive process. And after that, it was easy for the next few rounds to raise money. We, you know, went from um, the, the uh, Series A round that we did in the summer of 2013 at 12 million pre-money to in the summer of 2015, two years later, uh, being valued at $1.8 billion. And it was at that point, like I could have thrown a rock and hit somebody that wanted to give us money. I had companies like Fox and Disney and Wellington and Franklin Templeton just throwing money at us. And then after that, uh, you know, we had some really tough challenges on the regulatory side. They started to regulate the industry and crack down. And all of a sudden it got really hard again. And our valuation plummeted. Um, the next round I raised was at 500 million after raising at 1.8 billion only six, seven months earlier. And then it was a real struggle to raise money. Um, after that, I tried to merge with our chief rival FanDuel that got blocked by the FTC. And I thought, geez, we can't catch a break here. Like nothing's going right. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, but we just continued to slog on. And then we, you know, a few days after we got that rejection from the FTC, we had a very lucky uh, gift where the Supreme Court decided they were going to take up the longstanding ban, federal ban on states legalizing sports betting. And so um, we decided we were going to go all in on that. We pivoted a bunch of resources, you know, roughly three quarters of our engineering staff over the next few months to building out a sports book. And, you know, about eight months, nine months, 10 months later, uh, sure enough, the Supreme Court overturned it. And at that point, I thought, okay, this is great. We're going to easily be able to raise money now. Um, this was exactly what we'd all been waiting for. The business is about to take off into high growth mode again. And I went back out there and it was really hard. And everyone said, yeah, but you got to prove yourself. I don't know why you're going to be successful in this business. It's totally different than what you're doing. Why are all the casinos not just going to take the market? And so we were able to cobble together around there. It was not easy. We had to have some existing shareholders. Rain Group was the big one who stepped up and put in um, you know, a big check when, when uh, they were inside shareholder, when a lot of the outside uh, firms wouldn't. Um, and, you know, several months later, we, we raised, uh, uh, we, uh, we, we launched in New Jersey. We were the first to launch a mobile sports book outside of Nevada. And it just kind of took off and we established big market share. And then, you know, only about a year and, uh, or so after that, we decided, okay, we're, we're going to go public. Um, so that was kind of the, the journey for us. It was a lot of up and down. Um, it was hard, then it was easy, then it was hard again. Um, and now it's easy again. So we never take anything for granted. I always tell my team, you know, you can't get too high. You can't get too low. It's an up and down thing, starting a company and building a company. There's going to be times when you feel like nothing can go your way and nothing's going right. And there's going to be times where you feel like everything's going your way. And uh, just as important to not get too down and too, you know, demotivated and lose focus when things aren't going well. It's just as important when things aren't, are going well. Um, to not start celebrating and thinking you've won anything yet. You just got to stay even the whole way through. With respect to uh, regulation, I think I'm right in saying that neither Florida, Texas, or California uh, are yet um, in, in play, as it were. Um, how important is it to uh, uh, broaden the footprint of, uh, the, uh, of online gaming um, to these other very large states? Very important. As you know, a large percentage of the U.S. population is concentrated in a small number of states. So, you know, the ones you mentioned are the three biggest. The fourth biggest, New York, just passed legislation. So very excited about that. Um, and we're hoping we can get some of the other top ones that you mentioned over the line. And um, not just done, but done well. I do worry sometimes that um, it's not just about passing legislation, it's about doing it the right way, creating a market that is healthy um, and that allows companies like us to you know, really grow and, and contribute. So uh, mm -hmm. that's just as important as getting legislation passed and a lot of politics involved. So sometimes it doesn't always go that way. Um, but, you know, very excited that New York got done. Now we have the fourth, fifth, and sixth largest states between New York, uh, Pennsylvania, and Illinois all are, are done. Um, so hopefully we'll get one or more of the top three soon. How would you say that DraftKings has so far changed the uh, fan experience and changed uh, sports in general? What, what, what impact have you had? I think we've really done a lot to engage the sports fan at a deeper level. So, you know, what I like to say is we don't manufacture sports fans, but we do manufacture, you know, really engaged sports fans. If you take someone who's maybe just interested in their hometown team or their favorite player um, and you get them playing on DraftKings, all of a sudden they're following every team, every player, every statistic, every game is interesting to them. Um, even games that are blowouts are still fun until the very end because their teams, their fantasy teams, or their bets can still be in play. So um, it's really about taking people who are interested in maybe a very casual way. And I'm a perfect example uh, of that in certain sports. Um, I was always a big fan in certain sports, but others I was very casually following. A good example of that is golf. Um, before I got into fantasy golf, I was, you know, I'd watch the majors and I knew the top 10 players probably, but now I know every single golfer. I know, you know, how they play on long courses, links, you know, all kinds of 
you know, different things. I know whose putting is, is strongest. I know, you know, who's been playing well lately, who hasn't. Um, and it just makes it so that that's, that's a fun part of it. It's not just about, uh, what I like to say is that um, you know, for most people, the reason they like DraftKings is the same reason they root for their home team. They want something that gives them a rooting interest in the game. You know, there are certainly a, a small percentage that are just tuning in solely to see great athletic feats, and that's certainly a part of it. But most people who are fans, they're watching to root for something. And they want to have some, as we call it, skin in the game. And I think that for most people, that's their home team um, or, or their favorite player. But what DraftKings does is it gives you something in every single game and every single play of every game to root for. Um, so it takes, it harnesses that core reason people are watching sports to begin with. It spreads it across everything, which is what increases the engagement. And that then in turn leads to increased viewership, increased purchase of merchandise and memorabilia, uh, increased attendance of, of game at games. Um, you know, it's a very virtuous cycle. And I love being in a business where you can actually benefit the content you're watching and vice versa. Everything rises together. You're not trying to take away from the game. It's actually adding to both. Um, and that's kind of neat. Is, is there an 80-20 rule applying where 20% of the uh, consumers are uh, spending 80% of the, uh, the money or spending 80% of the time uh, on, the, uh, on the platform? Not the time, but the money, yes, which is true of everything. I mean, most business, not every business, but most yeah. businesses, I think, work that way. Um, and we're no different. Um, from a time perspective, no. I mean, there's people that some of our most engaged customers are the ones playing the 25 cent games or the dollar games or the $3 games. And they're as into it as anybody who's playing for more. But from a, a money perspective, there's definitely a concentration uh, like what you described. You know, could, could it be the case that uh, fantasy teams will uh, supplant uh, real live teams? Do you ever see that uh, happening? Uh, is there a certain constituency of consumers for whom that's a possibility? I don't think so. I mean, they're so complementary and work together. I think it ha you have to have one without the other, really. Okay. Um, what, what about the partnerships that you've uh, had to uh, develop? I mean, you seem to work with pretty much every league, every team, every web, every athlete. Uh, um, how, how do you build these relationships and how are they important to the success of the business? Well, one of the things, you know, I touched on a moment ago is that um, the great, you know, one of the great things I think about our product and our company is when we succeed, um, it, it results in more success, more engagement, more fanship for the leagues, for the teams. So um, that, that core principle, they're very aware of. They know that. Um, they know that, you know, having us be exposed to more of their fans will, will create deeper engagement, will turn more casual fans into mega fans. Um, so it's kind of starts there. It's like there's, there's a desire already. Uh, on the part of the leagues and teams to utilize the products we offer to engage their fans and to drive, you know, increased revenues, increased viewership, increased game attendance for them. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, uh, if you turn it around, it's the same back to us. Uh, the more that people are watching and the more we can get our brand out there and our offerings out there exposed to the platforms that the leagues and the teams have, um, the more customer acquisition we drive, the more engagement we drive. So. Um, we're already starting from a standpoint where both sides, you know, see a very obvious reason to work together. It's not the same as, um, you know, if you're a beer company or a mm -hmm. car company, like you could advertise anywhere, the most natural and obvious place in the world for us to advertise or where the sports fans are. And the most natural and obvious advertiser for them to take is us because it not only gets them the advertising dollars and increases engagement with their content. Uh, you know, so through that, there was just always, a very, it was always very easy for me to get in the door and to meet key people at the leagues and the teams, our business development people to meet them. Um, you know, and then one, one, that, that's half the battle or, or maybe more, more than half the battle is just getting in the door, getting to the right people, getting interest. Once that's established, then, um, you know, you find the right ones that really view it as a partnership. Don't just view it as how do I auction this off to the highest bidder and we can 
well in those. So we try to avoid them. Um, if we see somebody running a process like that, uh, we'll usually go and find somebody else to partner with. Um, Cause there's so many out there. There's no reason to, to go with somebody that's just doing it to try to make the highest dollar. We, we point to the fact that because of what I was saying, you want to pick the right partner that can actually create the most engagement for your fans. So um, the good news is 90% of them get that. And, um, you know, it's quite an easy discussion when you start from there. Okay. Um, so we have uh, the Q and A function open several, uh, uh, several of you on the webinar have already sent in questions, please feel free to do so uh, via the Q and A function. Um, let me, uh, let me just uh, ask a couple that uh, have popped up so far. Um, so, so one, one question I think is an interesting question, especially in light of uh, um, some of the objects that we see on the shelf behind you. Uh, and that's really a question around work-life balance and you know, the, role, the role of your spouse, who I think has an MBA in terms of you know, helping you as a, uh, a coach and mentor as well. Well, first, uh, I'm at my parents' house, as we talked about earlier, I did a, a wonderful celebration that John Yu led and organized in Blanca. Thank you so much um, for being a part of it and, and for driving it um, to honor my father's retirement after almost four decades as a professor at the U. And um, this is my mom's office, so um, I do not have dolls in my office. <laughs> But uh, as far as my wife, I am very lucky. I have a, a, a wonderful, intelligent wife. Her name is Shannon. Um, she's, you know, I think the hardest working person I've ever seen. She's incredibly smart. She was valedictorian of her high school. So she was a lot better than I was uh, in, in high school and a lot smarter than I was. And, you know, she's actually uh, not just somebody that, you know, has helped me from like, you know, being uh, the mother to my children and uh, a great supportive wife. She's actually somebody because of her background in business that I can get real advice from um, when I'm facing problems on the business front. Uh, so I'll go to her and I'll ask her if she's not too tired from a long day with the kids. Uh, I'll say, hey, there's this thing I'm wrestling with and just talk it out with her. And, you know, sometimes she'll tell me what she thinks. Sometimes she'll just talk it out with me and help me come to an understanding uh, of what I think. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have uh, have her. She's also an incredible mother, an incredible person, and um, I've been very lucky that uh, I have her in my life. And um, I also have four beautiful children that she and I have, have had together in our raising. Um, so someone's asking about uh, DraftKings marketing strategy. Um, early on, uh, you featured uh, advertisements with players who won big on the website and uh, um, I think there was cash falling from the uh, ceiling. It was uh, uh, very attention getting. Um, were those ads especially effective? Were they controversial? Have you continued those or changed your approach? I think they were very effective, um, but I don't necessarily think they put the brand in exactly the light we wanted. Not really just with consumers, but with you know regulators as well. Uh, that felt that maybe it made it seem like it was a little bit too much about the money and not about the fun of the product and the engagement. So um, we've tried to strike more of a balance where, yes, we talk about because it's an important feature of the product that you can win money, but we also talk about, you know, the actual game itself and how it's fun and how engaging it is. Um, and one thing I, I realized I didn't answer the last question exactly on work, work life balance. Um, so quickly on that, I, I think that's very hard. Um, as an entrepreneur, you, you, you have people that constantly need something from you and um, things can happen at any moment and it's unpredictable. So you could think you had you know, time off to do something and all of a sudden something comes up that you have to deal with. And so it is very important to have people around you that understand that. Um, and it's also important to really be able to distinguish like what is something that really needs your immediate attention now? What is something that can wait? Um, oftentimes those lines get blurred and it's hard to tell because everything feels important, everything feels critical, everything feels urgent. So just trying to be really objective about, you know, is this something if I told my kids I was going to play with them for an hour, is this something that really can't wait an hour and I have to say no? Or is this something that I can, you know, say, listen, I'm going to be there in an hour, but I'm doing something else and um, the world won't end if I wait an hour. And the other thing I would say is you have to pick where you, you spend your time. Um, 
you know, some a piece of advice I've had from a few people along the way is uh, you can have, you know, if, if you look at um, work, family and friends um, and hobbies uh, and, and, you know, exercise, you, you got to pick two or three of those things. You can't have all of them. Um, so, you know, certainly I haven't done as good a job, I think, uh, keeping up with some of my old friends. I, I've had more time, you know, uh, now to talk to them a bit, but during sort of the thick of building it, it, it was hard. And um, especially with young kids at home, you know, when, you, when you're not working, every ounce of energy is sucked up by your family. Um, and you don't want to disappoint your kids if they've been waiting all day to see you and, you know, suddenly jumping on a phone call with a friend of yours. So you do have to prioritize and pick and um, it's not possible to do it all. Great. Um, so here's a real inside baseball question, which I'm going to have to read because it's uh, very uh, DraftKings specific. So the question is, would DraftKings consider creating a marketplace on its platform where place bets, especially parlays, could be bought and sold by users? Based on DraftKings' current cash out feature for placed bets, a parlay increases in value every time one leg of the parlay hits and users may be willing to buy or sell already placed parlays. DraftKings could charge a fee for every bet traded. Uh, number one, can you translate that for the lay audience? And secondly, um, what's the answer? Well, we have considered that. And um, to translate it, basically what they're saying is that if somebody made a bet that they no longer want, they could sell that bet to another user who might be willing to pay, you know, 90 cents on the dollar or something for it. Uh, and, you know, means the first person doesn't want it anymore. So they're willing to sell it for less than what they paid for it. Um, and the second person gets a deal on something that they would have maybe bet anyway. We thought about that. What we've done instead, and some of this was mentioned in the question, is we have a cash out feature. So we basically made it so that if you decide on your own, I don't want it, we'll buy it back from you versus letting somebody else do it. And that was the reason we did it. It was just a simpler way to do it. You're not counting on having and find, trying to find another user that's willing to buy that bet for a particular price. You're just saying at any moment in time, if you want it, we'll buy it back. Um, and so that's a way to kind of get at the same thing that the other person's trying to, uh, or that the, the other feature will be trying to get at without um, the complication that you may not find a buyer if there's a seller all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, what strategies did you employ to acquire your initial user base, given that in the early stages, there weren't enough users to justify big prize tournaments? Well, what we did actually, funny enough, you mentioned that is we actually guaranteed big prize tournaments that we knew we didn't have enough users to fill. And that had the dual benefit of one, you know, the prizes were big, so people wanted them. And two, people knew that because the pools weren't filling up the game, the contests, I should say, weren't filling up. Um, and, you know, there was going to be what they call overlay, meaning um, say there's like a $10,000 prize pool, but there's only 8,000 of entries in, that that actually tilts, um, you know, a little bit more favor towards the players because they're, they're you know, similar concept we were saying before, they're getting a dollar's worth for 80 cents uh, in terms of the overall prize pool. So that attracted a lot of the higher volume players and it also made people want to put in more because they knew that the um, expected value was more tilted in their favor than if the prize pool, if the contests were, fill, were filling up. Um, the other thing that we did was we really, um, you know, utilized a lot of digital channels initially. We didn't start doing TV and things like that till later. So Facebook was um, one of our first big channels that we figured out worked um, and you know, uh, it, was, it, was, it was, by using the digital channels, one, it was a lot less sort of, of a heavy lift to do creative, things like that. Um, you could turn campaigns on and off, um, test for small budgets and optimize quickly. Um, you know, a lot harder and a lot slower to optimize channels like television and radio. So I think, you know, between guaranteeing the big prizes and putting a lot of money towards, you know, prize, uh, contest prizes that we knew we wouldn't fill up, uh, and then, you know, really utilizing digital channels that we could rapidly test into uh, for not so, you know, large budgets and learn quickly what worked and then, you know, double and triple down on what worked. Those were some of the early strategies we used. Uh, so we 
had uh, quite a number of questions come in in the last five or six minutes. So I'm going to briefly summarize three of them. Um, one is, how do you, at this stage of the market development, how do you differentiate yourself from competitors? Um, obviously, uh, FanDuel is mentioned. Um, secondly, uh, what are your international um, expansion priorities, if any, uh, particularly with respect to uh, Asia? Is there any interest in Asia? I think you mentioned uh, the UK earlier. Um, and then thirdly, uh, when, you, when, when, when people say you need a spokesperson connecting to your user base, um, what do you say to that? I'll try to remember each of those to remind me if I missed one. Right. So, one, um, you know, around, um, sorry, the second one I'll start with. Um, you know, we've definitely thought about international expansion. Right now, there's such a huge opportunity in the U.S. that I think that, um, you know, it's really, it's not to say we wouldn't consider expanding internationally, but I think we need to do it in a way where, we had a, a separate team, whether through an acquisition or through hiring up that was focused. We wouldn't want to distract our current team um, that, you know, every day are engaging in, um, you know, a very competitive environment to win the U.S. and um, have the most success and the, the, the best business in the U.S. As far as differentiation goes, the first question, really, um, I think the most important thing is product. It's a market um, that is very viral. People talk, um, people understand, you know, uh, where the best products are and um, where the best experiences are, where the best customer experiences are. And so having, you know, a brand um, is great. Having a big advertising budget is great, but really having the best product uh, is the most important thing. And having the best product is driven by underlying capabilities, like having the best technology you can build the best product and iterate on it, having the best data and analytics, uh, having the best data science. Um, so you can have um, you know, a real capability to use data to make smarter decisions and, and um, understand what the customer is looking for and what's working uh, faster than any of your competition can. And then as far as the spokesperson goes, I mean, we've thought about that. We've definitely at times had um, you know, people that we featured in commercials and things like that. Um, I think you know, it's a strategy that works, but one of the challenges with the spokesperson is then you're very tied to them and that can be good, um, but then it could also be bad if that person ends up in some controversy, for example. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, but we've always decided we didn't want to be too heavy on one particular spokesperson because then your brand is so tied to them. And by the way, sometimes it works. A great example of that is one of our board advisors, Michael Jordan. Uh, who virtually created the Nike brand, um, you know, by being attached at the hip to them. But, um, you know, uh, they got lucky. Michael was an incredible, not just an incredible athlete, but also somebody that um, really was a smart uh, businessman, a great brand mind. Um, you know, and there, there's one in a million like him. So it's hard to find somebody that really can do that and that you can completely trust to be so attached to your brand that, um, you know, you'll live and die by, by their brand. A uh, couple more questions. Has DraftKings looked into partnering with content creators or media companies to expand the customer base? Uh, the question of reference is Penn Gaming's acquisition of Barstool. Um, a second question is, um, why did you go the SPAC route instead of a traditional IPO? And third, and probably the last question, given we're running out of time, um, which sports are likely in the next five years to be the biggest sports uh, in the fantasy sports and or DraftKings universe? Would you give a ranking of where you think uh, the pecking order is likely to end up? So um, the first question, I think media and gaming are extraordinarily synergistic and linked, um, you know, very very simply, not only did the media companies in many cases produce sports content or licensed sports content, back to what I was saying before, you know, our game drives their business. They also drive ours in the sense that we have so, um, so much advertising on media properties that drives the customer engagement of our customer base. 
Um, we did uh, acquire a company called Vsin, uh, V-S-I-N, the Vegas Sports Information Network recently. We announced that. Um, that's, uh, you know, a, a, a network um, and content creation shop that produces sports betting content, which is obviously very you know, relevant to us. Uh, we recently announced that we hired Brian Angelo, uh, who is the former chief business officer at Verizon to be our chief media officer and lead our media business. So um, I think that's a pretty big statement. We're, we're going to concentrate a lot more energy there in the past. We didn't really have a choice um, up until we went public and then raised some more capital. Um, we had to make some real trade-offs. We didn't have a ton of funding in the bank. Um, very different now. We have about $2.7 billion in cash as of our last earnings call. Um, so we're really now able for the first time in company history to invest in a meaningful way in the media and content space. And, um, we're excited to be able to do that. As far as the SPAC question goes, you know, it's interesting because as popular as SPACs have become, when we decided to do ours, it was it was not the case. Um, you know, there was it was almost like SPAC was a, a dirty four letter word. People people thought that it was a bad thing. The companies that could go public the normal way wouldn't ever do a SPAC. So why would you do a SPAC if you're a good company? The reason we did it is I had met um, Harry Stone, who was the sponsor uh, of the SPAC that we did, Diamond Eagle. And um, he had just years ago educated me about SPACs because um, he was the one who actually came up with the idea when I wanted to merge DraftKings and FanDuel of using a SPAC to do it. He said, why don't I take an offer to both your boards and um, that could be a catalyst to try to get the merger discussions going. And um, what he taught me through that process is that with a SPAC, you can actually merge two companies together, really merging three companies together, including the SPAC uh, itself, because the SPAC itself is a company. Um, and so years later, I was acquiring or looking to acquire this company called SB Tech. SB Tech was a sports betting uh, technology and product platform that um, we felt was absolutely critical to us being able to have an entirely vertically integrated stack. Being a product and tech company, um, we think it's critical to completely control your vertical stack and to be able to do whatever you want and not rely on third parties. We have a, a third party we use now, done a great job, can be, but um, we just, you know, we're such a product and tech company in our core that um, we really just didn't see a world where we wouldn't own the entire control of our vertical product stack. So, um, we were looking to buy this company. We also wanted to go public. And this was in mid to late 2019. At the time, obviously, I had no idea COVID was coming. I was a little nervous about the state of the markets because we've been on this 10 year plus bull run. I didn't know how long the window was going to be open. Um, so all of a sudden, it occurred to me, you know, hey, uh, we could do a SPAC because I remembered from back, you know, many years earlier that you could actually buy a company and go public at the same time using a SPAC. Otherwise, you'd have to do a private equity or private debt round, buy the company, and then, then you could go public. And you know, between that, those two processes, it probably would have been you know, a good year, year and a half um, versus you know, just seven months it took us to do the SPAC. So I called up Harry Sloan, um, who had a new SPAC at the time, Diamond Eagle, and I said, what do you think? And he loved the idea. Um, so that, that was why we did a SPAC. I, mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of companies do it for other reasons. I didn't really understand everything at the time, but there another good reason to do one is you can provide um, much more forward-looking projections, and um, you know that helps you maybe tell a story of your business if your business is really about what you're building in the future. If you have a unique sort of business that prompts that, you can do price discovery. But those really weren't the drivers for us. The driver for me was I wanted to go public. I wanted to buy a company. And I didn't want to take the time it was going to take to do it in two separate processes because I was worried, you know, what you just never know. Um, if people knew when the market was going to go down, we'd all be, you know, much richer than we are. So I just wanted to take advantage of the fact that I knew the window was open and do it all at the same time. And then and the, 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 third the third question related to uh, which uh, sports do you think are really going to be at the top of the heap? You know, I think a lot of the same sports that are around today will continue to do well. I don't think the NFL is going anywhere anytime soon. NBA is really on the rise. Um, baseball obviously is, you know, has some headwinds, but I think they're, they're figuring out some ways to modify their game to do well. And then I think some of the more up and coming sports, 
Uh, I think soccer is on the rise in the U.S. It's funny to say soccer is on the rise because it's been the most popular sport around the globe for many, many years, but it has never been as popular in the U.S. as it is in other parts of the world, um, but that's changing. If you look at, uh, you know, soccer, it uh, highly indexes to the younger demographics, so I think that bodes well for the future of that sport. Um, I think golf, uh, you know, golf is so personality driven. Um, Tiger did such amazing things for it, but you have some really cool people like Bryson DeChambeau doing some really interesting things right now. Um, so I think golf could end up being something you see really, you know, rise in recognition. I think it's a perfect sport for betting to golf and baseball and, you know, NFL too for that matter because there's so many stoppages in play. Uh, and then esports. Um, esports, I think, is, you know, for anyone under 40, uh, you know, you probably watch some esports at some point. And, um, you know, esports is going to get more organized and become even more powerful than it is today. I think Activision's doing some interesting things there, but really, um, it's still as big as it is. It's still early days because the organization around it isn't at the same stage of maturity as some of the other professional sports leagues. And I think as that starts to come together, you're going to see it continue to grow. So, uh, last question: uh, Since you love Miami so much. Has Mayor Suarez been on the phone to you to uh, get you to move to Miami? I have not heard from Mayor Suarez yet, but I'm a big admirer of him. He seems like a great guy. Okay, well, he he monitors everything uh, that's said in uh, Miami, so I s expect you'll get a tweet within the next uh, five minutes. All right. Okay. I <laughs> J Jason, I want to thank you for uh, being with us for this uh, hour conversation and uh, um, you know, we're so uh, delighted to uh, honor your father today uh, uh, for his 39 years of service as a distinguished professor of economics here. Uh, thanks for enabling us to do that uh, so graciously and uh, good luck to you and all your family as well. Thank, thank you for you being so with us. Thank you for a great day and I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, have a good evening from mm -hmm. Miami. Thank you.